Hi, and welcome to ESMAConf 2023, the evidence synthesis and meta-analysis in our conference. We're delighted to have you here with us this week. We've got an incredibly exciting and packed uh, schedule full of workshops, tutorials, panel discussions, and presentations. We hope that you're going to enjoy it as much as we have enjoyed getting it ready for you. If you want to know more about what's on, you can check out the program at www.esmaconf.org, and you can follow us uh, on Twitter at ESHackathon. So before we get stuck into uh, the conference program itself, I wanted to give you a bit of a background into ESMAConf and a little bit of our history. We established ESMAConf in 2020, and since then we've run two events, ESMAConf 2021, where, where we had a little over 500 registrants, and ESMAConf 2022 uh, last year, where a few over 850 people registered. The aims of ESMAConf are to build a community of practice on the use of R for evidence synthesis and meta-analysis, to support the development of and showcase novel tools and frameworks for evidence synthesis and meta-analysis in R, to build capacity for the use of R in evidence, evidence synthesis and meta-analysis, and to raise awareness for the need for rigor in evidence synthesis and meta-analysis. And so, although there is a focus on R in a lot of what we do, many of the tools that we showcase are um, provided in a way that doesn't require knowledge or previous experience of R. And many of the um, training events that we provide uh, are not specific to R, they're um, specific to evidence synthesis and meta-analysis me methods. So it's really meant to be a very welcoming community where anyone with any experience of evidence synthesis or R can learn a bit more in a uh, safe and uh, welcoming environment. So we have this week presentations on packages that are designed to assist reviewers across evidence synthesis stages from planning to communication. We have demonstrations that um, integrate evidence synthesis packages into an interoperable pipeline in R. We've got novel applications of R packages in an evidence synthesis context. We have reports of uh, people automating evidence synthesis methods in R. And assisting novices to R in performing evidence syntheses with the aid of gra graphical user interfaces. So although, as you see and I mentioned before, it is an R focus, there is also a focus on trying to make the tools that are available in R um, available to people who don't have a background in it. We also have um, a range of training workshops um, that are provided throughout the week. Uh, and we do have um, the intent to start some hackathons. We don't have any hackathon projects running live this week. We did last year. Um, but this year, we're hoping to start off some hackathons. So keep an eye out for the um, conference program and you will see opportunities um, available to dive in and uh, join a hackathon, um, whether it's one spe specific to uh, producing an R package or a shiny package, or something that isn't about R, <coughs> excuse me, that's more about um, hacking an idea or a framework. So don't worry if you're not an expert in R or a coder in R, um, some of those opportunities might arise during the week that would be relevant for you. I also wanted to say thank you before we get started to the organizing team who've helped to make this event a success. And indeed, to everybody who's provided uh, a presentation, a recording, or uh, running a workshop. It's a huge amount of work that's gone into this event. Uh, and I'm personally very thankful for everybody's efforts. Our host, as always, is the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon. And I established uh, the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon, my name is Neil Hadaway, uh, with Martin Westgate in 2017. And the aim of the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon was to host hackathon events to help develop frameworks and tools. So far, we have a little over 30 projects that have developed under the auspices of the Evidence Synthesis Hackathon. And we also run the annual ESMAConf uh, which focuses on training, showca showcasing, and collaboration. We have a growing library of tools that include some things you may be familiar with, like Predictor, RobViz, Prisma 2020, Citation Chaser, Metadat, and Evi Atlas. But if you want to check out more, then please visit 
at www.eshackathon.org. I also wanted to give a shout out to our funders. Um, this year, we're still supported by Code for Science and Society, um, which gave a very generous um, body of funding last year to support as um, AsmaConf 2022. Uh, and we are still being supported this year. Um, and the funding that they provided helped to provide bursaries for caregivers uh, and people with resource constraints and also uh, funding for having subtitles verified. Uh, so thanks to CSNS for that. I also wanted to thank our donors and uh, people who've registered for the conference. Um, voluntary registrations have provided a huge amount of funding this year and we're looking um, at now being self-sustainable. So this is a really exciting development and thank you all um, for registering and, and for donating um, throughout the year as well. I also wanted to give some important notices before the conference properly starts. Uh, we have an accessibility um, policy and under that policy, um, we ensure that EsmaConf is fully online, that you can watch it live and in catch up um, it's worth noting that maybe 10% of people watch live, 90% of people in our records are watching and catch up. So um, whether you're live with us today um, or watching uh, at another date, perhaps later during this week or later during the year, um, you're very welcome. And we hope that the ability to watch in your own time uh, and at your own pace uh, makes the event uh, more accessible to you. We do use English as our primary spoken language but um, all of our recordings are subtitled and those subtitles have been verified manually, which means they're auto-translatable. Um, so far, this seems to work pretty well. If you click in YouTube on the closed captions icon, the CC icon, you can um, select subtitles and then you can um, auto-translate and uh, select a language to translate into uh, if you would like to see subtitles in a language other than English. Um, and under this policy, we always include costs for translation um, and where possible um, signing as well. Um, and we prioritize these in our, our grant applications that we, um, we submit to try to uh, generate new funding for ESMAConf. Unfortunately, this year we don't have uh, funding available for um, for signing services, but we hope that the subtitling um, goes some way to um, make the event as accessible as possible. Um, you can provide feedback about the conference um, in any format that you prefer. Um, we do have a feedback form um, for the conference, so um, look out for that on the ESMAConf website if you'd like to give us feedback. Um, and you can uh, send us a DM on Twitter, you can um, contact us on Slack if you're registered, um, or you can send an email to one of the conference organizers and details of who we are is available on the website. So some all, um, also some important notices about our code of um, conduct. We have several commitments that people will be treated with dignity and respect regardless of age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage, civil partnership, pregnancy or maternity, race, religion or belief, sex or sexual orientation. At all times, people's feelings will be valued and respected. Language or humour that people find offensive won't be used, for example, sexist or racist jokes or terminology which is derogatory to someone with a disability. No one will be harassed, abused or intimidated on the grounds of his or her race, nationality, gender, sexual orientation, gender reassignment, disability or age. Incidents of harassment will be take or, taken seriously. And if you want to raise a concern or a complaint, um, you can um, contact the organizer of um, Evidence Synthesis Hackathon, which is me or Martin Westgate, um, or EsmaConf, um, if you feel you've been treated unfairly on the grounds of a protected characteristic, um, and you're encouraged to raise these concerns with an organizer, um, which you can do anonymously if you like. You can email the conference organizer, which is me, at either of those um, email addresses. Or you can use this anonymous form, bit.ly slash esmaconf underscore feedback. We'll investigate all submissions uh, thoroughly. And you can provide, uh, you can find more details about our um, code of conduct at bit.ly slash esmaconf underscore access. 
uh, which includes our um, accessibility policy as well. So we do ask that um, if you're using Slack or Twitter, if you're engaging with someone else from the conference or one of the organizing team, you just bear this in mind and we try to maintain a really welcoming and um, positive community here. So um, I also wanted to give some details about the number of people um, and number of presentations and content that we had last year because it's now been um, over 12 months since our last event uh, and I wanted to give you a bit of an update. So as I said before, we had 863 registered participants last year. We had 29 presentations across eight special sessions and six workshops. As always, it was 100% free. And here's a link to our YouTube channel if you want to share that. Um, across the uh, year, we have had 7,200 views of last year's uh, conference materials across 353 subscribers as well. Uh, we've had, uh, during the conference last year, which was a four day period, we had 861 unique viewers, um, totaling more than 3,000 uh, unique video views. And, uh, and we had 142 new subscribers during that week as well. So um, welcome all of the returning subscribers to this year's ESMAConf. And, uh, and welcome to all of you new people as well. I just wanted to show as well the viewing figures um, over the last 12 months for ESMAConf um, immediately in the days following the conference. And you can see that we really are having a continued interest level across the year in this content. So people are still engaging with the talks um, day after day, week after week and month after month. So thank you so much for engaging with it as participants. And if you've engaged as a presenter, we're incredibly grateful. The materials in the conference are clearly really interesting and really useful for people. So this is really exciting and a great thing to see. I also wanted to give out a shout out to um, our most popular video from last year, which was um, a workshop on searching that Alison Bethel from the University of Exeter Medical School provided for us. Um, and so far, uh, that two-hour workshop has had uh, over 850 views, which is corresponding to 12% of the total channel views um, from last year. So well done, Alison. It really goes to show how um, content like this is really important and really vital. So uh, these numbers are increasing and um, we're, we're still really excited to see more people engaging and benefiting from this content. So thank you again. Moving on to this year, we have again 29 presentations this year. They're across six special sessions on planning, collaboration, and review management. We've got two on searching and record management, two on quantitative synthesis, and one on data visualization and communication. So you can see there that R isn't just about meta-analysis, and this conference definitely isn't just about quantitative synthesis. There's some really important, really interesting content there on that, but it really goes to show how interested people are in um, all of these stages of evidence synthesis and meta-analysis around the quantitative synthesis. So thanks so much for that interest, and thanks for submitting your abstracts. We've also got an amazing 10 workshops. Um, we have Meta-Analysis with R, which is already run by Wolfgang Wittbau, which is a satellite event that ran last week. And then as part of the core conference content, we've got a workshop on testing and adjusting for and reporting publication bias, one on wrangling large teams for research synthesis, one on reporting guidelines for transparency and evidence synthesis, one on testing automated deduplication methods in evidence synthesis. We have one on network meta-analysis using R package and NetMeta. There's one on screening studies for eligibility. We have two on GitHub, uh, one introduction to GitHub and one advanced Git and GitHub. An introduction to R Shiny for those uh, user interfaces. And one on a uh, FEAT framework for critical appraisal. Uh, and appraisal tools in systematic reviews. So a really diverse set of workshops uh, and really exciting uh, content there. Thanks to the workshop organizers who've been able to provide that for you all. We also then have nine panel discussions. We have one on considerations around tools and information retrieval, um, uh, tools for information retrieval, including text analysis, how we scale evidence synthesis education and capacity building, 
controlling for publication bias, building a community of practice, the benefits and challenges of taking part in a hackathon, stakeholder engagement and evidence synthesis, the role of rapid reviews in the R evidence synthesis ecosystem, a Q&A with coders, and a session on barriers to open synthesis and how to remove them. Along with that, we have over 55 uh, 10 to 20 minute tutorials. Each tutorial introduces uh, a new R package. So this is an incredibly exciting content. You can dive into this as and when you want to learn more about how to use a particular package. And they are um, interactive. There's often data and code available. Uh, and these sort of video vignettes really aim to um, make it as easy as possible for you to use these packages. Uh, and we're incredibly thankful for um, this enormous group of um, tool developers who've put these uh, together for us. And you can see just some of them highlighted in this word cloud here. So how exactly is the conference working this week? Well, we've got workshops that are being held via Zoom, which some people have registered for. These are live streamed to YouTube, but the people who've registered via Zoom will be in, um, in a webinar and they'll be able to ask questions and get answered live. We then have special sessions which are being premiered live on YouTube. These uh, feature a range of different talks about um, different things from evidence synthesis, meta-analysis and R. We've then had uh, individual um, presentations that have been pre-recorded as well. So as well as being able to watch the sessions premiered live or in catch up, you can watch each individual talk that's part of these sessions uh, and you can dive in uh, do a deep dive into whichever talks in the content um, of the program you're really interested in. The tutorials are released um, in the morning and evening of each day, half a dozen or so tutorials each day to spread out across the week. Uh, and you can watch these and catch up as and when you want. You can ask questions via a Twitter thread. So each uh, presentation will have its own Twitter thread. Um, and you can do this, for example, by um, checking out one of the threads here and then hitting the comment button to ask a question um, and then hopefully the presenter will be able to answer that question directly um, on Twitter or will be able to um, pass their answer on. If you're registered you have access to our exclusive Slack channel and you can ask questions and engage with other um, participants and presenters directly there. So that's it for the introduction to ESMAConf 2023. We've now got an incredibly exciting keynote by Shinichi Nakagawa, and he's going to talk to us about the future of meta-analysis uh, and his perspective as an evolutionary ecologist. Over to you, Shinichi. Hello, uh, my name is Shinichi Nakagawa, and I'd like to um, thank organizers who invited uh, me and also who organized this uh, awesome conference online. Uh, today, I'd like to tell you about um, future meta-analysis from my perspective as evolutionary ecologist or evolutionary biologist. Okay, first, I'd like to acknowledge my lab members at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, also uh, important co-authors and my colleague, uh, Will Conwell and Corey Callahan. Um, both were used to be at um, UNSW, but um, Corey moved on to University of Florida as a new assistant professor. Okay, so first I'd like to tell you about um, meta-analysis beyond the literature-based data and give you a, like a really good example. And, um, you know, you may be thinking it's like a individual participant data meta-analysis, IPD meta-analysis. It's kind of close to that, but it's sort of like ideas goes beyond that. Okay. So citizen science is changing the way, um, you know, biologists collect uh, biodiversity data. And many probably ecologists and evolutionary biologists have heard of GBIF. GBIF is the Global Diversity Information Facility. This is a meta uh, database. So database of databases. Um, it has lots of different nodes across the world and it's collecting millions of observations of um, uh, species data every day. And one of the this node database is eBird. And uh, for eBird, 
my kids are even contributing and probably among the listeners, there's many people contributing. This is not my kid, but you know, you can contribute this through, you can get mobile app, eBad mobile, mobile app, and you can put all the species you have seen per your uh, birding trip. Important thing is you can put time and how much you walked about, how many people participated, and also, most important, I want you to remember this is how many species you have seen and um, how many of individual species you have seen. Okay, so this is gonna be quite important a bit later on. Uh, based on the citizen uh, data set, we actually estimated um, number of species, not the number of species, number of species, no, number of birds in the world. It turns out to be around 50 billion. So little shy of 10 birds per person in the whole world. And uh, yeah, done by Corey, me, myself, and uh, Will. And this is um, not only EBA data, but uh, some survey data uh, to estimate not only the number of birds, but the number of birds per species using some data uh, imputation method. Um, which is based on like how easy to detect color, flock size, and body size, and uh, conservation status. And we were able to estimate this. This is, this is pretty amazing to me. This was not possible uh, without citizen um, science data. But this is not quite meta-analysis, which as you know it, and this is a global data analysis. So I will tell you about meta-analysis example from my lab. And, um, but before I go to that, I need to tell you about the second law of macroecology. What it is, is abundance occupancy relationship. This is from Babak, uh, Babak et al's paper and the relationship is, so this is abundance, how many individuals you've seen and how widespread the species are. So each data points the species. So, idea of abundance occupancy relationship is widely distributed species are more abundant per unit space. And this, this is slightly counterintuitive or intuitive, I don't know, depending on, on a person, but uh, this has a conservation and a fishing corner, some applied um, implication. And uh, sometimes it's used because if species widespread, they're abundant per unit, so you don't need to worry about those species. Also, you can actually get more fish for that species, yeah? So that's an important relationship. And there's a reason why this is called the second law of macroecology, because there has been a meta-analysis. This is the traditional uh, literature-based one. Uh, so they got... Um, nearly 300 effect sizes, and the correlation was nearly 0 0.6. So ZI is just a Fisher's transformation of um, correlation coefficient. This is a funnel plot. Um, you might be uh, used to seeing it like a 90 degree this way, but um, what you can see is that this is zero and all the data points that sort of like, you know, most dense one is around like this 0 0.6. And uh, this was done by quite a few years ago by Blackburn et al. And um, that's that. That's why it's, a, it's a definitely by far the strongest relationship I've ever seen in ecology, if by far, yes? This is why it's called a uh, second law. However, uh, if you read uh, related to literature, there's a disregarded hypothesis. Uh, easiest explanation of this relationship, abundance occupancy relationship, is sampling bias. And a sampling bias hypothesis, even though disregarded or rejected in the literature, in the current literature, it states widely spread species are easiest to observe because it's uh, most um, widespread. So if you go around in the survey in the area, you see this first. But if you actually exhaustively um, observe that one area, this relationship would disappear. And also maybe, you know, the in the current literature, published, published literature, 
there might be publication bias. So people go on a sub in an area, maybe they're only um, publishing a strong correlation. So overall, what we saw in the meta-analysis, this might be biased or like, you know, this 0 0.6 seems too high. So here comes the citizen uh, science data. How are we gonna uh, utilize the, this citizen science data? Because there will be no publication bias if you use it at all, because people are not 10 citizens uh, collecting, you know, millions of people are doing it. EBIT, they are not concerned about, you know, whether this is significant or not. Okay, how do we do this? So each of these data points, uh, checklist and this millions of checklists here and it's included nearly 8,000 species and this is the example three checklist in the US, Europe and this is Australia you can imagine that so Corey goes out and birding and he's um, he saw uh, beaters about 10 of them that's a good day and he observed about 30 different species and each of them how many and we can calculate correlation between local abundance, not the global abundance, but the range size, because range size, you can get estimates from GB for eBird, and we can correlate. So each checklist, which I talked about, we can get the abundance information, occupancy relationship, I, we already know for these nearly 8,000 species. So each checklist, we can calculate correlation of this relationship, abundance occupancy relationship and we can aggregate using meta-analysis and this is called the final plot i get explain this a bit later more in the next slide actually so it's a precision so number of in this case species higher number of species you go and you put more effort you get to the, this global mean and we are expecting this to be like around zeta of 0 0.6 or above if there is a publication bias happening it will be smaller so that's the meta-analysis we conducted and i'll uh, show you the uh, result results is look like this it's a bang on zero so that's we were not expecting this at all because this is a second law of macroecology we based this meta-analysis on the effect size of the uh, nearly 17 million um, correlations and this was based on the observation of 3 billion births, individual births. And the overall effect is almost zero, 0, 0.015. Actually, it turns out to be because it's, we have a 17, nearly 17 million effect size. And this turns out to be significant, but I get to that point later. This is almost meaningless significance, yeah? But it's very close to zero. What's most surprising is uh, some of you are familiar with I square. I square is extremely small, and this is probably smallest. One of the smallest I've seen in ecological meta analysis because it's a mixture of different you know, places, species. What it is, it's indicating is there's a lots of variation you see, um, almost all variations um, uh, due to. Um, difference in sample size. And as you can see, so precision here, as precision increases, number of sample size increases. So those are like, you know, a couple of hundreds, hundreds of species observed. Those are, the, I think we excluded smallest ones. So I think you have to have about 12 species at least or something like this. And if you are observing just 12 species, this correlation, I expect it to vary due to the sampling, uh, sampling error, yeah? That's why meta-analysis included sampling error variance explicitly to account for this. But what's surprising is almost all variation we see is due to the sample size. This actually really indicates this relationship must be close to zero, um, despite this the second law. And actually, the original meta-analysis, Blackburn's meta-analysis, conducted a fair number test to, they claim that uh, more than half million unpublished narratives would be required to nullify the effect of this magnitude correlation 0.6, but that's okay. We have, <laughs> we got it covered because we have a 17 million, not just a half million data set, um, sample size. It's interesting thing is you remember this sam sampling variance hypothesis, this is disregarded in the literature. However, 
So this is effort time. So the log one effort time is about three minutes. Log five is three hours. And as you can, uh, this is it's very hard to see. This is 17 million uh, data points. So if you are observing very little time, actually this effect appears a little bit, but it completely goes to zero if you observe three hours. So actually this is a huge support for the sampling variance hypothesis, which nullifies the second of, uh, law of uh, macroecology. So I'm wrapping up this part of the talk, future of meta-analysis, the data integration. So putting different data together. So we already know literature-based meta-analysis. Now there's lots of archived raw data. We're using raw data. This is the IPD meta-analysis, individual participant data analysis. But now we, we can use citizen science data. Also, you can actually you know, put together different type of um, data, such as climate data. And I quickly tell you the one example from our um, lab. And this is a study by uh, Sami Berg at our lab. And she collected, uh, this is the disease frequency. So the, you probably heard about the coral is affected by bleaching event. Um, not only bleaching event, they are affected by different diseases that's worrying. And she collected about 200 papers on the frequency of disease last you know, several decades. And it shows um, it's the frequency is increasing, yeah? But not only that, she, uh, she was able to collect Temperature data per this different studies, it comes from you know all across different oceans. And you can uh, she was able to also show temperature significantly correlates or predicts um, disease prevalence. So this is a percentage of disease. So so this is what I call uh, what I mean by data integration. So second part, big data and a meta-analysis. Um, Okay, so there's a couple of um, different um, parts to it, but those are a bit shorter than first part. Um, can I talk to my um, computer science colleagues? They think like, you know, all meta-analysis would be obsolete, you know, big data, we just gonna visualize, analyze big data um, directly. And uh, I actually personally disagree, and they also disagree with this view. Michael Chang and Susanna Jack, they're both meta-analysts. And what they propose is, so you have a big data here, but rather than analyzing it one go, you can uh, divide into chunk. Maybe that has like, you know, data, big data heterogeneous. So you can split by places, split by year, split by different traits, or all sorts of things you can split by. Then you can actually calculate uh, effect size in each, you can meta-analyze, yeah? So this is a called split analyze meta analysis approach. And we have certainly used this approach. And because of this approach, we were able to analyze big data. An example of big data we use is the International Mass Phenotypic Consortium. You may not be familiar with this, but the, all data available online, and it has more than 500 trades. 100,000 mice of both males and females across 12 institutions um, across the globe. And using this data set and uh, the split analyze, meta-analyze method, we looked at the sexual dimorphism in not the mean traits, but the variability of traits. So those distribution widths of the trait, whether there's a sexual dimorphism or sex differences, and it indicates certainly yes. Another one we used this uh, split uh, analyze, meta-analyze method is we looked at sex difference aromatically. And this particular uh, study I want to tell you about. And aromatically, what is aromatically? Aromatically, so let's say this is the female male. Um, this is exactly the same aromatic relationship. And it's a log linear usually relationship. Your body size increases, your eye size increases. Your body size increases. Uh, you don't move as much. Yeah, this is a wheel, the running. So another one is this is actually aromatic relationship it's different, but the mean traits overall means the same. Um, male and female has a, two groups, 
groups have uh, different uh, allometry. And this case means different and slopes are different. And uh, there's a, another thing so we can measure. So differences mean differences of slope, that's allometry, and the uh, difference of residual variability. So actually those means and variability are done in different studies. Those are the sexual dimorphism, relates to sexual dimorphism. In the mean, those are variability. So that was the first paper. So we are most interested in the slope differences. So we used uh, nearly 400 phenotypic traits for each. We got um, effect sizes. This is a split bit, split by phenotypic traits. And we meta-analyzed per functional group. So we conducted nine meta-analysis using nearly 2 million uh, uh, data points from many mice. And this is what it looks like. And the most important is the slope one. This is a meta-analysis of the absolute differences in male and female. And what you need to pay look at is if it's around zero, male and females are similar, but if it significantly deviates from zero, uh, these slopes are quite different. And you can see immunology, it's a lot more different between male and female, and also behavior. But uh, I'll explain, this is a bit hard to understand, explain the implication. So many cases, many traits, not all the traits, many traits, uh, slopes are different. So what does it mean? So this is a scenario, like this is the beautiful uh, picture, uh, you know, drawings done by Shimek Drobenyak. Uh, you saw him in the first, uh, second slide in acknowledgement. So male and female, exactly the same. And those three traits, you know, three traits among those many traits we looked at, fat tissue, retinal clearance rate, and metabolic rate, if they're exactly same size and on average, you can give the same uh, dose of drugs, that's no problem, but that's not true. Usually female mice are smaller and the people often, um, how do you say, assume it's a you know, perfect scaling there. So you can scale those three different traits as well. Uh, same rate as, you know, people assume the females, small males. In such case, you can just give uh, two pills rather than three pills. But the, our studies, allometric difference between sex indicates you can't do that. Body size, the same proportion scale, but those uh, different traits maybe relates to the drug metabolism scale differently between male and female slopes are different. In such case, if you just use male scaling slope, you might give two pills, that's an overdose in female, it's bad for female. But if you understand the female uh, specific slope, you'll be giving uh, right amount of pill. So this, you know, the giving um, overdosing or underdosing a female happens in mice and humans because when they uh, test drugs, they're only using males or human male subjects. And we need to change this. So big data meta-analysis, hopefully I convinced you this is really um, useful approach. And the last section I'd like to tell you about. Um, so last two sections were about, you know, we can use all sorts of different data, not confined to the literature-based data, but how we do meta-analysis are changing as well. Just a couple of examples. Um, this paper came from uh, Evidence Synthesis Hackathon, that is a predecessor of this conference, and the which I was involved um, in. And there, we talked about this new ecosystem for evidence synthesis. Currently, when we do uh, meta-analysis or evidence synthesis, there's empiricist and here's a synthesis, and uh, there may be different people, the same people, but what's happening in the uh, empiricist, some of them, they don't publish. So all I thought, is not translated to the primary research. And we were only able to synthesize primary research and it leads to biased view of the evidence synthesis because we are synthesizing biased evidence base. Regardless, it's you know systematic map or you know meta-analysis or qualitative analysis. What we propose the future is not only just, you know, we should make the empiricist or synthesis involved, we should make a community of on a topic, all people working, because regardless of whether they publish or not, we can actually, because they are all part of the community, they can um, contribute to the 
all the synthesis primary uh, uh, literature, regardless of their contributing, that we can synthesize all the effort. And this will lead to the unbiased evidence base. And uh, we should make it all open, open data, open code, and also you should use preference, then it's all open to the, the public and the stakeholders. And the, finally, I quickly touch upon this hot topic, you know, that I wrote blog to the our lab's uh, blog page, and uh, I use ChatGPT to see whether I can use this for the title on abstract, abstract screening, uh, not um, full text screening. But uh, one topic we were, I was able to get very, very good result, and I was really impressed. So I wrote this blog, but um, I think the next five years, use of AI and uh, in the evidence synthesis will increase uh, its presence. And um, I wouldn't be surprised in the sort of near future, it can do the all the screening and also all the extraction of moderator effect size might be difficult, but I we could be surprised. So all those things are changing and it's really um, exciting future is coming, I think. So take home messages from my talk is it's really bright future by combining different type of data, which um, I call the uh, data integration. And the meta analysts have a critical role to play in the era of big data. It's really data rich, um, data rich um, era with um, few or little theory. And uh, you know, you can use meta analysis to generating theory. So, you know, this will keep our, us meta analysis very busy. And um, so we talked about, you know, at, uh, at toward the end, community-based synthesis and AI will change the way we summarize evidence base. You know, that that's pretty exciting. And finally, I, I looked, like to thank meta analysis, your audience, and the future matter. <laughs> I think everybody should do meta analysis, the conclusion of this uh, talk. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Shinichi. That was a really interesting talk. I hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. So that's it for our opening session. We are really excited to have you here with us this week and we look forward to sharing the rest of our exciting program over the next few days. If you want to know more about what's on this week, check out the program at esmarconf.org and follow us at ES Hackathon on Twitter for all the latest updates. Thanks very much.